for everybody on the phone and uh, appreciate your joining us today. Very excited to have the opportunity to join the Nature Preparedness Summit um, and tell you what we're doing uh, with Sarah Alert, um, a little bit more about it. Um, uh, and, and I'd say it's just been so gratifying to work so closely with the public health community at the state, local, tribal, and territorial level, and the federal level as, as we build this national um, resource. So with that, I would like to make some introductions of our panel. Today we'll have a brief presentation, and then we will have a panel discussion, and then there'll be a chance for audience to ask questions. Um, I'll start with Dr. Oscar Allen. Um, Dr. Allen is the Chief of Programs and Services at the National Association of City and County Health Officials, which probably most of you have heard of. Um, he is the um, oversees over $28 million portfolio of programs, along with membership and meeting services. Oscar has his doctorate of public health, focused in health policy and management from the New York Medical College, and a master's in public health uh, in environmental health and epidemiology from the University of Albany. He spent 15 years in, in active public health practice at the Rockland County Health Department, uh, where he served as director of epidemiology and public health planning and responded to major emergencies, uh, including West Nile, anthrax, smallpox, monkeypox, H1N1, botulism, MERS-CoV, and Ebola. Dr. Lane is past president of the board of directors of the New York State Public Health Association and past president of the Alpha Gamma chapter of the Delta Omega Honorary Society of Public Health, and immediate past president of the epidemiology section of the American Public Health Association, APHL. I'm sure you'll, you'll join me in welcoming Dr. Allen, and it's been really an honor to have you here. Next, I'd like to um, introduce Elizabeth Gronway. She's the chief epidemiologist for the unified government of Wyandotte County, Kansas City Public Health Department is her master's degree uh, in public health, and she has a passion for epidemiology um, and data-driven health policy. His experience in communicable disease investigation, surveillance, data analysis, and health education with an interest in furthering epidemiological work and the impact of health policy and public health. And welcome, Elizabeth. Uh, you've been a tremendous partner to us. Next, I'd like to introduce Sarah Robinson, who, rumors aside, uh, Sarah Alert is not named after, but she can claim that if she wishes. She is the Director of Infectious Disease Epidemiology uh, at the Maine Center for Disease Control and Prevention. Um, she is an infectious disease epidemiologist, holds her Bachelor of Science in Human Biology and a Bachelor of Arts in Literature from Brigham Young University, a Master's of Public Health and Epidemiology from the University of Michigan, and a master's certificate in informatics from the University of Illinois, Chicago. Prior to joining Maine CDC in October 2008, Sarah was a research assistant for the Cancer Epidemiology Education and Special Populations Program at the University of Michigan. So thank you to our panelists for joining us, um, and we'll be hearing more from them uh, shortly. They've all been tremendous partners as we work together on Sarah Alert. I will launch right in then to uh, some background information on Sarah Alert, so we all have level setting about what we're talking about. Um, so Sarah Alert, basically, um, as we launched it, we launched it as a a, um, a system which we knew that we would be turning over to public health. So we made it for public health to be available free of charge for public health, which of course meant tremendous collaboration was necessary. So just really quickly about what a mitre is, because it's an unusual animal and I didn't fully understand it until I had been here for a while. But mitre is a not-for-profit organization. We operate um, a, what is called a federally funded research and development center for the Department of Health and Human Services of the US federal government. Where these entities came about is back in the 50s uh, when Sputnik was launched, the Cold War, U.S. government realized they didn't have the scientists, engineers, mathematicians, and now public health professionals who could really help them address the needs they had for innovation and research and development. So they created these federal entities called Federally Funded Research and Development Centers, or FFRDCs. And then they created a class of not-for-profits, of which MITRE is one. And MITRE, as those other not-for-profits, will hire the scientists, engineers, mathematicians, and public health people, and then we operate that federal center. What we bring them is a partner to work side-by-side -side with them, often on pre-decisional material, 
um, and really help them, whether to innovate, think of new problems that need to be solved for them, um, or, um, and I'll give you a real brief example. Um, when when uh, the Homeland Security needed to go to a five fingerprint system or a 10 fingerprint system from a two fingerprint system, the vendors out there said, okay, two times five is 10, you owe us five times more money. MITRE came in and developed a 10 fingerprint system for less money that the federal government then bid out to the um, private entities. We are not allowed to bid on commercial business because we work side by side in the background for the federal government. Now, the reason that's all important is that one of the responsibilities we have as a federally funded research development center is to maintain internal research dollars to innovate and do research. So last summer when we heard, uh, last summer several of us got together, myself as a former state health official and former executive director of ASTO, and I've been involved in every emergency since the original SARS. Um, we had a former state epidemiologist, a former local epidemiologist. We got together and we said, we know public health needs this capacity so let's start building it. And then as soon as China occurred, none of us knew how bad it would be, but we went to the leadership in MITRE and said, can we access that research dollars to build a tool for public health to do contact tracing, to actively man monitor people in isolation and quarantine because public health needs such a tool. And MITRE's invested over a million, probably close to $1.2 million in this and is now available for free to public health jurisdictions. Next slide. So basically, what are we, what are we look, do, looking at? We've built a system designed to, by working with epidemiologists and public health nurses, to automate the process that you have used for a long time, um, that a proven process of, disease, of contact tracing, of identifying people who are exposed and monitoring them in quarantine, identifying people who are ice, uh, sick and monitoring them in isolation, to both protect the individual and protect the community from further spread. Every step of the way this was done with key public health organizations. Dr. Allen was available day one when we locked in a room software engineers and public health professionals and epidemiologists to say, how do we do this? And the public health people would whiteboard out the process for contact tracing, isolation, quarantine monitoring, and the engineers would ask a million questions and start coding. We also have a highly secure system we, MITRE also operates FFRDCs for the intelligence community, for the military. These same engineers built this because we know the importance of personally identifiable health information and how secure that database needs to be. We also work for the Network for Public Health Law on uh, data use agreements. And it is scalable. So we are building this so that millions and millions and millions of Americans can be monitored if it is, uh, if it is necessary. So the key point is the system is built to create efficiency in what you do as public health professionals. It is not, I'll say as a physician, at like an electronic health record, which fundamentally changes how you work because we don't like that too much as docs. So next slide. So again, just to say public health, as you all know, is no command and control. There's no one who can direct our federated system of public health, which means we had to work at all levels. At the federal levels, we worked Clearly with CDC, with ASPR, Assistant Secretary of Response, with Homeland Security, because they have a medical branch, with the DOD and the Defense Health Agency, with uh, the Veterans Health Administration, many different groups across the federal government to gain their input collabor and collaboration. At the state and local, territorial, and tribal level, we work with ASTO, NACHO, APHL, CSTE, CDC, CDC Foundation, Network Public Health Law, and others to make sure we're truly engaging with public health. We like to say this is built with public health for public health. And when we set out, we knew we wanted to have a state, we wanted to have a local jurisdiction, a metropolitan area, a tribal jurisdiction, and a territorial jurisdiction. And we were successful in bringing on all the skills partners so that we could test this in all the necessary environments. Next slide, please. So basically, where do we fit in? We hear a lot about the Apple, Google applications, the proximity notification apps, and many people mistakenly call those contact tracing apps. They are not. They are proximity notification applications. Currently, we do not interface with those. They're really at the top of the funnel in terms of they're highly um, sensitive, not very specific. But in the future, we may work with some of the jurisdictions, and we are having discussions with the 
uh, about five of the SAR alert jurisdictions that also do contact, uh, also are launching Apple Google type applications. But where, where, where SAR alert really works is with public health on contact tracing, on monitoring people um, carefully in isolation and in quarantine, again, to protect the individual, contain the outbreak. Next slide, please. So I'll quickly go through at a high level um, how the system works. We do do demos every Tuesday and Thursday, and um, we can provide uh, an email later where you can look in for that. We'd love to have you join us and see a, a demo much more uh, extensively. But basically the way it works, when someone is exposed or sick, they can be enrolled in SARA Alert. Now that enrollment can occur by an individual reaching out to them, speaking with them, and keying in their information. We also can import data from Maven, from Redcap, from, um, from uh, NBS systems, um, from Excel spreadsheets, FEX, so that we can make that more efficient for you. We also have an HL7 Firebase API that in the next release will allow machine-to-machine -machine, uh, communications with your other systems out there, make it even more efficient. Once someone is enrolled, they get a choice. Do they want to communicate on a daily basis over the web or email or text messaging, or would they like to receive automated phone calls, which means that they can even go to old fashioned telephones if people don't have a smartphone. People report in on a daily basis on their symptoms based upon the CDC symptomatology, and that is also highly configurable. The report they send in is encrypted. It goes into an encrypted database um, and then is separated into line lists. So for, for exposure monitoring, i.e. those people who are contacts and in quarantine or being monitored for their exposure, it sets it into three different line lists. The most important and highest priority is people reporting symptoms. So your EPIs, public health nurses, would first contact those people, verify the symptoms, and decide whether or not they need testing or a clinical visit, um, and then they might move into the person under investigation category. The second priority is for people non-reporting. Why are they not reporting? Are they still in quarantine? Or perhaps they lost their cell phone, or perhaps they're sick and they need outreach. And that will be the second priority for reaching out. But one of the powers of SARA Alert is that for people who have been exposed but have no symptoms, SARA Alert will ping them every day. They will report in every day. And if they're asymptomatic, that pattern will continue for the 14 day period of time. And SARA Alert will then release them for the system. So we estimate that somewhere between 50 or 70% of the population who are exposed don't develop illness. SAR Alert automates that so that public health does not have to spend time reaching out and finding those people um, who are asymptomatic. Um, so, and then isolation monitoring, I'll go through it more quickly, but people who are ill, either reported in by a clinician, a laboratory, perhaps they came from the exposure monitoring, um, it gets separated into line lists, those who are not recovered but continue to follow non-reporting, in some cases this holds the power of law, and then meets the recovery definition. There are three different recovery definitions built in here based on CDC guidelines, testing, non-testing, and then for people who never develop symptoms. That's a high priority where an EPI or public health will contact the person, validate whether or not they have met the recovery definition, and then free them to the wild so that they don't infect the community by being released too early. All these users are credentialed, whether it is the, uh, the enrollers, which could be National Guard, students, or public health people, or volunteers. Their credentialed can only see their information they put into the system. We have the full user, the public health nurse or EPI, who can enroll. They can also manipulate the information, talk to people in isolation or, or exposure monitoring. And then we have an ability to just look uh, credential people as analysts and all they will see is de-aggravated, de-identified data in the monitoring report. So I won't, there's not more time to go into this, but please come and join us for a demo. Um, and uh, why don't we go on to the next slide. So one of the things we knew early on is we quickly had to stand this up on a platform. So Sarah Alert is built and it is hosted as a, a web-based tool. We do not ask people to download something onto their uh, a cell phone or, or smartphone. We did not think foreign nationals who want to put a government application on their phone. And secondly, it does not do proximity notification or track where people are through GPS, Bluetooth, or anything else. We didn't want to cross that privacy threshold. It is hosted as a web-based um, application on the APH Elm Ames platform. 
which every state, um, the CDC, Office of National Security, use and trust. And APHL has been a tremendous partner uh, for us in this initiative. And it is FedRAMP, APHL, Amazon website, FedRAMP compliant and meets the security standards that are necessary for public health to engage in this. Next slide, please. In terms of partnership, again, we built this at, at every stage, you know, and perhaps some of our panels will talk about it. We have a regular user forum uh, where NATO has stood up, the user forum where people can get in, discuss, talk between states, tribes, locals, and territorial jurisdictions and support each other. Every other week, we have what we call our principal partners uh, meeting. That is the CEOs um, and others, like, and, and their seconds like Oscar, from the uh, APHL, from NATO, from ASTO, from CSTE. Um, we also have uh, CDC representatives on there and Judy Monroe from the CDC Foundation. That is, if you will, our kitchen cabinet who's guiding us in, uh, along this initiative um, because we know this is being built for public health and with public health. We also have a number of uh, what, we, what we call weekly sprints. What we did is because we're racing a pandemic, we released a minimally viable product with the idea that we would do something called agile development. That means that every two to three weeks, we release an update based upon the feedback we get from the users in the stilts territories. Um, we're up to the 11th um, reiteration of this now, um, and we're now planning our 12th uh, 1.12 to go forward with new improvements. Um, so at every step of the way, we are dependent upon the users before we release something live, we have users go in and test it. We try to break it for us to make sure that when it does get released, it meets their needs and we haven't introduced any other problems. Another very interesting thing here that a group like MITRE can do is we have a whole set of communications um, professionals. And one of the things they're doing is monitoring the, um, the media, including social media. And you can see a little diagram there. And we often, therefore, pick up early signs of issues in communities and then can go work with the jurisdiction to say, we're picking up this reaction from your community to how this, the SAR alert is being used. Or we're seeing this response to the way it's being reduced. Let's work together on the appropriate communications and outreach. And that has been a lot of fun um, and very gratifying to do. Um, next, uh, next slide, please. So our adoption right now, this will show you a diagram of where we are live. You can see on here states. Some of these states are, are centralized. Some of these states are decentralized for home rule. You can see where we're working with counties in, uh, separately from the states. Um, you can see the Kansas Jackson Pass Wyandotte, who we hear from, is the Kansas City metro area. And we have uh, two territories, Puerto Rico and CNMI, uh, Commonwealth Northern Mariana Islands. Um, importantly, we are also, because we're a nonprofit and we want this software out there, um, we are working with other vendors who will build this into their product that they sell to people. So both the Marshall Islands and Mississippi have come on through a vendor who services some of their other things. And we don't really, we just want public health to have the tool it needs. And if they get it through us, great. If they get it, that's great also. Okay, next slide, please. So just to show you right now about the usage, we've had over 300,000 people a month. We have um, almost 5,800 public health users, whether they're enrollers, whether they're contact tracers or epidemiologists, public health nurses that are that have been trained and are using it. In total, we're at almost 600 different jurisdictions across the country. Next slide, please. It's had some interesting, and I'll just quickly, interesting, if you will, uh, branches to it. We got a lot of interest from the universities, and I'll show you in one second the number of different universities. So what we did is we partnered with something called the Oak Ridge Associated Universities. It's an association of about 120 universities across the country, and we are working with them to support them in rolling out a SARA Alert academic for the camp college campuses to allow them to um, stand up campus life once again. Now, having said that, there are two ways um, um, higher education could come in. And why don't we flip to the next slide. In many states, Pennsylvania, Maine, and others, um, you can see those in purple here. Those, are, those colleges are coming in through their public health agency. That is an option if you want to delegate a university as a, if you will, a sub-jurisdiction or monitor their students, faculty, and staff for them. 
The other option that's being created is the ORA consortium and, and the other universities where they would come in through a separate instance of SARA alert design for their, uh, their universities, most likely and typically in jurisdictions that aren't using SARA alert. So next slide, please. So I wanna just say it's been so gratifying to work with um, public health community and I particularly uh, I wanna acknowledge Dr. Frieden um, the resolve to save lives took it, looked at all the applications contact and said this really is one of the top applications we found worldwide and you acknowledge that this is really working with public health for public health and that's where my heart is and that's why, what I would like to do and we can see these other uh, from both uh, Arkansas um, and from the Commonwealth Northern Mariana Islands really the, the striving and the stressing of the partnership that we all have so next slide please so thank you very much. There will be time for questions and answers before. Sorry, there's a bit rushed, but there's a lot to discuss. Um, and I, again, I wanna highlight, we're building this with public health for public health. MITRE is a not-for-profit. We will turn this over. We are, no one is being charged for anything we do. And I will say that we are very fortunate to have a CDC award now because they saw the good work going on and are working clo closely with the CDC to make this an available opportunity for any public health jurisdiction to utilize. Back to you, Danny. Uh, so thank you very much, Paul, for that really excellent presentation. Now that we're going to move, we're going to move on to the next section here, and uh, we really encourage you to continue asking questions in the chat box over on the right side of the Zoom. And uh, I'm going to make sure that your questions are addressed during this the uh, discussion after this panel discussion. And so as they're just, as they're talking, just make sure to write in whatever is coming to your mind, and we'll make sure that's gone out to the panelists. So uh, at this time, I'd like to ask the panelists to turn on their video and microphones, and I'll turn it back over to Dr. Paul Jarris to lead this discussion. Great, so Oscar, Elizabeth, and Sarah, thanks really for joining us. And, and again, thanks for your tremendous partnership. And Oscar, I'd like to start with you. So you've been involved uh, from, in, with Sarah Alert from day one, uh, when for a brief period of time, we almost called it Oscar Alert. Um, sit with uh, Laurie Freeman um, on the partnership team along with CSTE, ASCO, APHL, CDC Foundation, NATO, and CDC. So really, what motivated NATO to commit the time and effort to really becoming a leader in this partnership around Sarah Alert? Thank you. Um, as you know, NATO represents the 3,000 county and city uh, health departments across the country who were uh, and still remain on the front lines of the response for uh, COVID-19. So uh, as we heard a lot of this uh, communication around uh, what's going to be necessary to help address the growing um, concerns and the incidence of cases and how uh, folks would need to be monitored. And of course, you had the nationals being repatriated back and uh, several of the jurisdictions being given 24 hour notices to say you're going to get a couple hundred or a couple thousand folks at the at the beginning of this particular stance and you have to monitor them and develop you know all these uh, criteria for uh, self monitoring, et cetera. You know, that just told us, you know, it was just something that was going to be monumental. Uh, but specifically for me, I had one of the first um, individuals to do uh, uh, self-monitoring after Ebola, uh, one of the first individuals in New York. So I knew what the experience was like in trying to manage just one individual for 19 days. So you expand that up for you know hundreds of individuals for at, at this point the 14 day time scale. So when Lori kind of put that call and said, we need your RP experience and your leadership, MITRE's doing something and, you know, it sounds like a good idea, um, you know, get involved and we'd like you to go there and represent the locals and get a bunch of locals to come with us. So it was that commitment to representing local health and understanding what the local experience is like and having something that hopefully can be designed with the locals in mind and not necessarily from a top-down approach, which has been uh, predominantly how the other tools have been developed over time. You brought two of your colleagues with you, which uh, we really appreciate. So. Yes, we always come, you know, bring folks to the party. Right, right. even the past president. Um, so, uh, Oscar, so why, in thinking about collaboration and partnership, what, why is it so important to have the software engineers in the same room with the public health professionals as we begin to develop a solution that ultimately will be for public health? I'll tell you, that experience in of itself was 
um, even mind boggling for me because I helped build a syndrome surveillance system that was developed that was essentially rolled out for New York State. So I understand the concept both for uh, building things with the software engineers and the technical expertise to even move and pass into the implementation piece. So, but seeing that experience or experience, and I would say the uh, interaction of having those folks in the room to understand what are the thought processes, what are the workflows and how things would operate from an epi or health perspective and where they in turn would take that information and develop their uh, software, uh, I would say processes uh, to develop a package uh, to really, uh, I guess, um, strategize what we think and how we operate uh, was something that was very, very intriguing because there are questions asking about our logic models, you know, why we do things this way, who falls into what criteria, and even specifically why it's important to have that conversation. There are differences in language. So what we may de de uh, describe as a case or we describe as a suspect or a probable, that needed to be articulated to the software engineers who had a different lexicon for how they look at things in different titles. So that, that, that's important to really make sure everyone was in the room with the right understanding of the need to collaborate. Yeah, and I, I remember actually the, the big debate over do we need birth, uh, date of birth or just age? And, and yeah. how public health said, no, nope, it has to be date of birth. And they're like, all right, yeah. you say. <laughs> so it was really fun. So uh, Elizabeth, can you tell us a little about Wyandotte County and why you chose to partner with Sarah Alert? Yeah, sure. So Wyandotte County is one of five counties that are part of the Kansas City metro region. Um, with a population of about 165,000 or so. And uh, Wyandotte County is actually, unfortunately, the um, one of the poorest and unhealthiest counties in Kansas as well. And so it became apparent early on that Wyandotte County was particularly hard hit by COVID. Um, we had the highest case rates and the highest mortality rates in the metro area um, since the beginning of the pandemic. and. Um, so I think it, it became apparent pretty early on. Um, we kind of had this moment of, oh no, we do not have the capacity to respond to this pandemic adequately. Um, before COVID hit, there was one epidemiologist, me, and one communicable disease nurse, and that's all our communicable disease program really was. Um, and so we quickly realized that we, we did not have the capacity. I'm sure a lot of other health departments also had this realization pretty quickly. Um, and so it was, kind of important for us to partner with Sarah Alert to try to expand our capacity as much as we could um, to, to improve our response to the pandemic. Right. And you've also been really involved with us in, in uh, making suggestions and helping us make improvements. So can you describe what was important about the partnership between MITRE and the MITRE Public Health and Engineers um, and on the ground public health professionals? Yeah, I, I think you mentioned previously um, how this system has been built with public health in mind. Uh, and so throughout the whole process of implementation and even afterwards, MITRE has been really receptive to our feedback and comments um, from the people that are actually using Sarah Alert um, and implementing it. And um, so it's been great that MITRE has been so receptive to feedback. Um, you know, I remember Early on, Sarah Alert was only in English, and Wyandotte County is actually one of the is a very culturally diverse county. We have um, a large Spanish-speaking population, and so Sarah Alert was pretty quickly able to implement Sarah Alert in Spanish as well, which was huge. Um, you know, we also gave suggestions and input about workflows, and um, so it's it's been very important that. Sarah Alert cares about the people that are actually using the system and their feedback as well. And can you describe, um, there's a number of counties in the Kansas City metro area that's come on. Can you describe any collaboration between yourself and these other counties? Yeah, so, so there's actually within the metro area, six different local health departments in the Kansas City metro area, um, which gets a bit confusing sometimes. And even pre-COVID, collaboration between all of these local health departments has been very important. All of the epidemiologists are in regular communication. Um, and since COVID started, we have weekly meetings to update each other on the COVID situation. Um, and so Wyandotte County was the first um, county within the metro area that went live with Sarah Alert. Um, 
and pretty quickly I brought it to my colleagues in the other counties in the metro area and said, you guys really need to look into this because as great as Sarah Alert is just standalone in Wyandotte County, there's really a lot of um, benefit to having other counties in the metro area on board as well. Um, the people in Kansas City are very mobile. You know, you work in one county, live in a different county, uh, play sports in another county. So we're constantly shuffling contacts back and forth and cases back and forth. Uh, and so by other counties in the metro area getting on board with Sarah Alert, it really made things more efficient. So you're able then to transfer uh, if somebody moves or, or you have a lab test in your area, but they live in another, you can send their file back and forth. Yeah, yeah, it's really easy to do that data management and data shuffling or, you know, it's quite common for people to have contacts that live in other counties within the metro area. Maybe they're on a sports team in um, Clay County or something like that, so. And, and if, if these counties weren't connected through Sarah Alert, how would you do that? Oh, it's a very tedious process um, that we kind of mishmashed together at the start of COVID. Um, you know, sending like encrypted emails with spreadsheets back and forth to each other with contacts or uh, calling each other, telling each other, hey, I've got a contact that lives in your jurisdiction. So, uh, which we just don't have time to do that kind of stuff in, a, in the middle of a pandemic. So it really expedites the whole process. Thank you, Elizabeth. So Sarah, um, first of all, congratulations on your, your research article um, in the NWR called Characteristics of Outcomes, Characteristics and Outcomes of Contact of COVID-19 Patients Monitored Using an Automated Symptom Monitoring Tool. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about the study and the outcomes? Sure. Um, we were very, very lucky to have a redeployed CDC team with us. And as we were launching Seralert, they came fairly quickly after we launched Seralert, and we thought it was important to figure out how the system was working for us and what kind of data we could get out of the system and how to help use that data to make our COVID response better. So we were able to get information on who the Sierra Alert system was able to contact. And we were able to find out that we were very successful in getting people to use Sierra Alert and they were very accepting of this automated approach. And we were also able to identify information about what languages people spoke and what their preferences were that were able to help us tailor when we um, talk about Sarah Alert, how to talk about it to get people to, to use it. And then finally, and probably most importantly, we were able to demonstrate that Sarah Alert was successful in identifying potential cases for us. And we were able to match patients in the Sarah Alert system into our surveillance system and determine how many of them we are identified because of contact tracing, which was really important for us to, to demonstrate that the system not only worked, but that it was doing what it was intended to do. Right. And I should point out that uh, Maine, uh, you actually did the translation, I believe, for us for Somali and French. That is true. Um, we identified that it was a huge need for us and it was a barrier for our um, residents to be able to use the system without those languages. And so MITRE was really great when we approached them and said, we really need this. And they said, how can we work together? And we got it done really quickly. And what kind of surveillance system do you use and how does it work with Sarah Alert? So the surveillance system that we use is MBS and we are, we have part of the system automated through to Sarah Alert and we've been working extensively with MITRE to figure out how to, to increase that interoperability between the two systems and to make them talk to each other better. Yeah. Yeah. So right now we're exporting it out and then import it in. Right. And, and thank you. You're one of the states that's working with our team to automate the API. So that hopefully we will be able to have machine to machine connections between the different systems. So thank you for being involved in that. It's, it's an example of how, you know, we don't take our engineers and lock them in a room and say, go figure this out. We're actually working together with you in the different states to figure out how it should be built. So, um, so what do you, um, um, in terms of the implementation, can you talk about that, um, how the partnership with the MITRE and, and, and your, of course, have partnered with many of them and your public health department um, has helped to, to make it a successful implementation? Absolutely. It never existed before. <laughs> and then in January. So. We, um, our OIT program has some very strict requirements for any systems that we're going to use. And What is that abbreviation? 
um, our Office of Information Technology. So any sort of new platform or technology that we are going to bring in has to go through a very thorough vetting process. And the MITRE team was exceptionally helpful and exceptionally useful in everything our OIT team asked for. MITRE was willing to pull together. If it didn't exist, they worked with the right people to make sure they could answer the questions. Um, without that partnership and almost daily meetings, we wouldn't have been able to bring on Sarah Alert. And so MITRE was, was essential in helping us make sure that the system not only would work, but that it would conform to our needs and so that we could use it long-term and it would be fully supported. And, um, and yeah. You know, I, I'm not sure, um, I may have failed to mention that before, but Sarah Alert is a tool that is really agnostic to the disease. So it isn't, it isn't programmed for COVID-19. All it takes to change the disease or the incubation period or the symptomatology are database changes so that it can be stood up day one of the next outbreak. And that's why we say it's an enduring tool uh, because uh, we knew we didn't want to specifically build a tool just for COVID-19 and the next outbreak, we've got to start from scratch. So I, I did fail to mention that, but it, um, yeah. And, and let me also acknowledge, Sarah, that Maine was one of the toughest states we worked with in terms of your security. It's true. You guys stuck with us and you made it through, so it was great. Yeah. It did feel like we were making it through. <laughs> Tough. Um, so Oscar, you know, from your big national perspective, um, what are some of the critical lessons we're learning in, in an outbreak, of building a novel tool um, that, that we should keep in mind for the future, um, any future outbreaks, or, or frankly, the next time we build a tool for public health? So somewhat based on even the main experience with you and the conversation just now with our colleagues, the need to be nimble the need to be uh, you know, flexible to the sense of uh, capturing what are those um, uh, needs that are going to be germane to the jurisdiction while at the same to token maintaining a centralized um, uh, standard for data collection uh, and interoperability, which is always going to be, uh, I know it's a buzzword that so we always say, uh, but we recognize that not everyone uses the same tool. So going back to having a tool that's agnostic something that allows for that interoperability, which doesn't necessarily uh, confound the process and make folks feel like it's more work just to do this. So I'll just stick with what I have or throw, you know, cautions the wind and just up, up and everything. So having something that's nimble, flexible, and interoperable, uh, it's what's really going to be uh, helpful for us to be successful along the pathway. The other piece that's going to be it, it, that is, outside of the technology world, it's more so the policy, um, is uh, getting the buy-in and the recognition that, um, especially from a state-based perspective where states are the ones, their technology officers may have their minds as to what they want to use from a state perspective, that it does not always translate into uh, ease of use or adaptability for the local lens. So being able to think about things, uh, not only from a self-contained, self-canned system, but how can you uh, allow for uh, better jurisdictional approaches that encompasses multitudinal needs of the populations uh, and the colleagues who will be working on those efforts. Thank you. You know, you touched off a thought for me that was important about, um, you know, the need to remain flexible, but also to have a national tool. Um, and that's resulted in some uh, really extensive and in-depth conversations with jurisdictions who comes forward to say, we really need this and we want this. And what MITRE, what we've done is to make sure that anything we build in meets a national standard so that we don't have different standards and different ways of looking at the same issue, depending on what jurisdiction you're on. What, what, what we didn't want to do was to build a tool like we saw with the prescription drug monitoring systems where each state's tool can't talk to any other state. So um, I, I'll, I'll say specifically, for example, we worked very hard with Pennsylvania. They wanted information um, on sexual, um, sexual orientation, gender identity. And so we worked extensively with them on finding out what are the national standards for data exchange on these and then built that in so that every jurisdiction could use it, not just one jurisdiction's definitions. Um, so, um, Elizabeth, uh, back to you. Um, can you, is it too early or can you point to either anecdotally or with data, any of the outcomes you're seeing or results you're seeing that you think are better off because you have this automated process? Sorry. 
sorry, you cut out. Was that question for, for me? Yeah, I'm sorry, Elizabeth. Yeah, you want me to repeat it or? No? Uh, yeah, if you wouldn't mind. Yeah, so I'm, I'm wondering at this point if it's too early or if you can talk about, you know, any results or outcomes you might be seeing as a result of using this automated process. And, um, as compared particularly to the older process that we traditionally use, the duct tape and bailing wire uh, to get these things done. Yeah, yeah. I'd say the biggest uh, benefit has been uh, just capacity um, and expanding capacity. Uh, for me, it didn't make much sense for me to commit staff time um, to having staff call people to monitor them on a daily basis. That's very time consuming. Um, so it, by having this automated system with Sarah Alert where um, they're the ones following up in Sarah Alert instead of actual individual phone calls, that's really allowed us to expand our capacity uh, and keep up better with, with the new COVID cases as they come in. Um, so that's been a huge benefit. And then also the data that you're getting out of Sarah Alert is a, is a great benefit as well that we didn't previously have. You know, how many people are following through with their monitoring and actually um, replying and um, getting that information about when people are coming out of isolation. Uh, that's all really valuable data as well. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and Sarah, let me ask you, the, you know, as an epidemiologist, um, how well does Sarah Alert match your needs as an epidemiologist? Is it, it, you know, uh, I, I am not an epidemiologist, well, which people point out to me all the time. So <laughs> I'll ask you your thoughts about it. Um, is it changing how you work or is it enabling how you work? It's both for us. Um, it's changing how we work in that, as Elizabeth has said, we don't have to make those phone calls ourselves, but it's also been really great to work on the updates to it to make sure that the symptoms match what the current CDC case definition is and to adapt the system to meet our needs. Um, it is. We've had to develop new ways to identify things in our system because we now have this new data feed coming in, which is Sarah Alert. So it definitely has changed how we work, but I, I think those changes are all for the better. Um, thank you. Um, and you've also been able to explore some new partnerships, I believe in Maine, uh, outside of public health. And I'm wondering if that's something you could discuss, whether that's travel and tourism or higher education or hospitals. Sure. So we've actually done partnerships and created a, a lot of sub-jurisdictions within Maine um, to allow our partners to be able to use the system as well. So our health systems all have accounts within Sarah Alert so that when a patient comes in or an employee comes that has been at work, has been symptomatic, that the health systems can do their own contact tracing and enroll their own employees and their own patients who might have potentially been exposed. And we now have partnerships with some of our higher ed institutions that will be doing the same thing. They'll be using Sarah Alert to monitor their students. And we're working on a partnership with K-12 schools, with public schools, to be able to have a way so that the schools can have a sense of what is happening in their school, but without having to keep paper spreadsheets and make phone calls every day to figure out how students are doing and where they're at. So um, it's been a big selling point for us to people that we can offer them this is a way that you can use a system that already exists, but it will provide this information for you and you won't have to do it manually. Yeah, and I think the, the K through 12 is another example of where we'll work closely with you. We're starting to explore what are the implications of yeah. K through 12 in the system, what the demands and load would that put on the system, and then what modifications might we have to make for it to work. So yeah. um, I don't want anyone to come away uh, with a notion that that is happening right now, it's an example of how we do expand what we're doing based upon the jurisdictions bringing new use cases to us. And I wonder, Sarah, I know, I, I believe Puerto Rico contacted you because of your traveler monitoring uh, and before they started their system. But can you talk a little bit about how you use Sarah Alert for travelers? Uh, we use Sarah Alert for travelers in a couple of different ways. Um, we do DGMQ notifications of exposed people and we enroll those in Sarah Alert as well. And then Maine is a highly tourist state usually. And so as if we identify cases that are physically in Maine, we've been doing the monitoring of those cases while they still remain in Maine using Sarah Alert. And 
it's brought up a lot of interesting conversations with some of our other partners in other jurisdictions about um, our capacity and their capacity and how to best use the systems to work for both of us. Right, and, and people are asked to test, get a test before they come to Maine, is that right? That is true, yes, within 72 hours of arrival. Now, Vermont's been asking people to enroll in SARA over prior to coming into the state. Are you doing that also? We are not. Okay. So one of the things we, it's, it's interesting to us how creative people are and how they use the system in different ways. Puerto Rico, um, I, I wish we had a Puerto Rican speaker here, but Puerto Rico is actually working with their travel and tourism department. And they have a, um, a traveler uh, declaration before some of the lands in Puerto Rico they are to complete. Um, and part of that, that completion will enroll them in SARA alert. So that by the time they land in San Juan, they're in the system. If somebody comes and, and then it will give them a QR code so they can demonstrate that they've enrolled in SARA alert. If they land in the airport without that ability to demonstrate uh, that they're enrolled, they will be enrolled in the airport in SARA alert. And then the, the Department of Travel and Tourism in Puerto Rico um, will offer them a test and then monitor them for, the, for two weeks uh, while they're in Puerto Rico as a traveler um, just to make sure um, they're safe and the community is safe. So it's been a very interesting uh, instance where they are uploading three, four, or 5,000 people a day into the system as they land in San Juan. So many, many interesting uses that we had never expected. Um, and, and I, I'm going to throw another round of questions, but I'd ask you panelists to think about uh, questions you might want to ask each other. And um, also, I think we'll get ready for the uh, audience soon, Danny. Um, let me um, go back to you, Oscar, for a second. Um, can you talk about uh, public health has really uh, just gotten some great support for uh, data modernization. and. Um, as we launch that data modernization effort, which would be a panel all in an all in of itself, can you talk about how some of the lessons learned from the Sarler partnership and development may inform other data modernization tools as we go forward? Thank you for that question. I've been involved in a number of those data modernization efforts and um, if I can say it this way, uh, the difference between the cellular process and the other uh, elements, I think, you know, underscores why the governmental public health approach does need to make sure that it has a strong voice uh, and is part of that particular solution. So predominantly, the other data modernization efforts have been focused primarily on the healthcare sector, the uh, physician practices, the hospital-based practices, and the investment in governmental public health infrastructure has never really taken off. And this goes way back even before when the ACA was coming into Endeavor. I always have made the comment, we're sitting by the information highway holding a bus pass because everyone else is getting fancy, you know, doohickeys and yet we are the ones still um, dealing with fax machines. Um, and I know there's several locals that are shaking their heads like, yeah, our fax machines were the standards. So the effort to look at data modernization and specifically the investments in how data is uh, collected and how data is uh, processed and how data is communicated uh, has definitely shown up as an area of concern with, in the midst of COVID. How many times you've heard, well, the data is not correct, the data is not clean, uh, the, the information is wrong or the information was entered incorrectly or we don't have the information. So a lot of this uh, points to why we need to be able to equip everyone and have a uh, equitable approach to data modernization efforts. Whereas in the past, several of the public health uh, processes have been focused at the state level and very significantly at the federal level, especially among uh, the CDC enterprise. Uh, so with Sarah Alert, we've taken that focus uh, at the governmental public health approach, looking at a combination of collaboration across all of those particular platforms, I think it illustrates why uh, you need to be uh, rapid and rapid moving and thoughtful and not necessarily waiting for a cascading, um, pardon the expression, paternalistic approach to data modernization. Oscar, I wonder, you know, we've, we've talked in part of what we're doing with our CDC uh, award from the Sarah Alert is really trying to envision what the a governance model might be for something like Sarah Alert. Um, Whereas we 
you know, it's our intention uh, at MITRE to basically turn this over to public health. That would mean having it hosted by APHL or someone else, but then also having an organization um, like a, a, a ASCO, NATO, CSDE, really take over the, the stewardship of this. Can you talk about, you know, and this is really one example of data modernization in a much bigger world. Can you talk about that process for how public health users should be um, looking at the governance of these data systems? We've had several um, experiences with governance. So there's been the Biosense process for biosurveillance where you went into Biosense 1.0 and 2.0 and having a community-based standard approach for uh, both governance and, and um, learning, uh, you know, case uses interaction. Then there's the, um, the digital bridge approach, which has uh, expanded out from the core public health, but looking at a healthcare sector, uh, private industry component. We also had the experience with JFIT, which uh, was a consortium of public health or entities that tried to address the health informatics uh, and the IT lens. Uh, and uh, let's just say uh, it got defunded because of the particular uh, you know, support uh, and questions about how specifically uh, was the JFIT's role of either uh, addressing policy or addressing innovation and practice. Uh, so you know, all of that goes to say that whatever technique that will be used uh, to address uh, the ownership or, and co-ownership and the continuance of governance will need to really be uh, thoughtful, not reactionary, uh, and very forward thinking, uh, because it allows for, as you kind of mentioned, the expandability of what initiatives are there, addressing how we can ensure that there is seat at the table, uh, and that we are articulating ourselves in a way that supports a not a one-time investment, but a continuum evolution of the work and the standards that which we ourselves have to abide by uh, in the field. Um, and Elizabeth, and I'll ask the same question uh, of you, Sarah. You know, where, what have you learned that you'd like to share with other epidemiologists and public health leaders in this experience, um, either for the current outbreak or for the future? Yeah, I think that one of the important lessons that I've taken away from COVID and this pandemic is how important um, adaptability and flexibility is. Um, you know, thinking back to March and April when this pandemic first hit the United States, there were, you know, we've learned so much since then and changed a lot of the things that we're telling the public and the way that we do things. And so Overall, just that ability to um, shift and be adaptable is so important. And um, I appreciate the way that MITRE um, has also been flexible and um, able to, to shift as needed from the feedback that local health departments are giving them. Um, so overall, just that, that flexibility as we continue to learn new things, you know, all the time about COVID as we move forward. Sarah? I think the most important thing I've learned with this experience with Sarah Alert in particular is to keep communications open. Um, no system is perfect and every now and then we'd find something that has really annoyed us, but we've just kept it to ourselves. And as soon as we tell MITRE about it, it's fixed. So it's nothing is perfect, but we have to keep talking to each other to make sure that we can make a system that works best for us and what works in another state may not work exactly the same way as what it would happen in Maine, but we can learn from their experiences and what has worked well from them to find a happy balance of what will work well for us. And all of the partners have been so willing to jump in and provide guidance and expertise and MITRE has been so willing to take those hard points for us and try and figure out how we can make them better. So I think communication is most important. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's been so much fun for us because we really feel like we're all in it together. And uh, it's uh, we also, really try to, to practice the, the continuous quality improvement, you know, mantra of every defect is a treasure. Yep. You can tell us about it, we can fix it. If you don't tell us, we can't fix it. Um, and then the, uh, it's my first time, and I don't know if others have been involved in this agile development process, because normally I think what we like to do is have a planning period where you get something near perfect, then you try it, and then you stop everything, and you make it a little more perfect. It can't happen. <laughs> we just don't have the time. Um, and and for actually, and you remember, Oscar, when we started out, we all thought we would have a summer lull. And we used to say, 
you know, we're going to build this thing a, a minimally viable product now. And during the summer lull, we'll build our Mo Nobel Prize winning application. But there was no summer lull. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's been an exciting ride for all of us, I think. So, well, thank you. Very you. Any questions you have of each other or any comments you'd like to make before we open up audience questions? Danny? We can want to go straight to the audience. That's, uh, you know, our colleagues out there. <laughs> Absolutely. Let's do it. This has been a really, really great conversation, everybody. I think we've all learned a little bit more about Sarah Alert and just the connections between all of you all, you all and the stories that you've been telling have been really powerful. So thank you so much for providing all your expertise. Uh, so from the audience, and please feel free to continue adding in the chat. We've got some time here, so uh, we will certainly be able to get to all the questions that have been asked so far. But if you have one and something that pops into your head as, we, as we're going, please feel free to add in the chat. So our first question comes from Sarah Black, and she asks, for those of you who have deployed Sarah Alert, what method of reporting, text, internet, regular phone, are you finding people prefer? Excellent question. And I, I believe, Sarah, you looked at that in your NMWR. Yeah, I can answer that from Maine. Overwhelmingly, text was the most popular choice. Yeah, I, I agree as well. Um, most people prefer text. Whenever we enroll people in Sierra Alert, we ask them what their preferred method of follow-up is. And most people do say text. Um, there is kind of certain demographics we've noticed that prefer the phone calls instead of the text, especially the older, um, you know, community members that maybe um, don't have smartphones, but most people text is the preferred method. Thank you, and we, we actually work with a service called Twilio that does those texting to do it in multiple languages. And um, it's been very interesting as we've grown now up to the 300,000 monarch tree levels, things pop up we hadn't necessarily anticipated or at least I as non-engineer didn't. And that is once you start hitting that volume of texts, sometimes the phone vendors see you as spam and they'll block your calls. So, we're actually going to something called short texts now to get around that and be pre-authorized, if you will, by the phone companies to communicate in that way. So uh, it's, I, I think the engineers are wizards how they figure all this stuff out. Thank you. Thank you for a great question. The next we have a question from Jennifer Dyfelm. Have you met resistance from communities that are skeptical of being monitored due to privacy and data concerns? How have you addressed that? I can start with that. Um, the answer is yes. We've had some people who are not thrilled about being monitored, but um, some of the ways that we've gotten around that, one of the biggest selling points of Serilar is that it's not an app, so they don't have to download anything to their phone. It's not a proximity tracker. And um, the other thing that people appreciate is the automatic purges. So after 14 days after they're released from isolation or monitoring, then their records, the identifiable portions of their records can be purged. And so people feel more confident that their name and all of their personal information won't be kept for ever, which has helped us. Thank you. Yeah, I'll, I'll echo Sarah's comments as well. Um, yes, there are people that are reluctant um, or resistant to be monitored, um, but those kind of points that Sarah mentioned about how the data is not permanently stored um, really kind of helps with assurance. And, um, you know, I kind of think of it that the people that don't want to participate in Sarah Alert probably wouldn't want to participate in any other kind of monitoring or public health interventions or phone calls or anything like that either. Um, so it's not really an issue with Sarah Alert as much as they just don't want to be followed up with by public health period. So it's not a good use of our resources to try to follow up with them. Um, I will say that I was pleasantly surprised the number of people that do agree to be enrolled in Sarah Alert. I was expecting more resistance and Overall, it hasn't been a huge issue, except for those people, like I mentioned before, um, that probably wouldn't have participated in any kind of public health activities, so. Yeah, and you know, one of the things we tried to keep in mind is no system is perfect. 
and you can't build it a system that 100% of people will agree to participate in. So really it's about improvement. And even if we increase that to 75% of people are willing to interact, that's 75% of people you don't have to call personally on a daily basis. So, you know, as much as we'd like perfect, it's really about improvement. We also do, our communications team um, does have, uh, does work with jurisdictions. So if we pick up something on, you know, on Twitter or whatever else, we will reach out. And uh, we did, um, on a couple occasions, we reached out to one jurisdiction that has a very uh, high number of survivalists, I'd say. Uh, and there was a particular threat made against the Sarah people. So we made sure we we picked that up, we reached out to that department, we let the sheriff's department know who this individual was. And, and of course, I, you know, nothing was gonna come of it, but, or on the other hand, we learned, for example, in Puerto Rico that um, they were monitoring people for two weeks. Well, some people left the island after a week and they're like, well, why is Puerto Rico still contacting us? We're not on the island anymore. And so we're working with them to develop materials so people understand that, that, um, that full two week period. And of course you'd want to know that because if they leave in a week and 10 days later they're sick, there's a bunch of contacts in Puerto Rico to monitor. So we're really carefully working on the communications and um, as well as, as actively monitoring misinformation and disinformation. And we, we have noted that we have had a number of articles in Russia and China and all over the world. So we wanna make sure that this is safe. Danny? Yes, an incredibly important discussion there because if people don't trust it, they won't use it. And it seems like those jurisdictions have done a lot of really good work to build that trust. And thank you, uh, EJ, for uh, preemptively telling me your name and saving me that embarrassment. I really appreciate that. But EJ's question is that I think I heard that Sarah Alert is available in RMI and CNMI. Will it be available in other Pacific Islands and freely associated states? Yes. Um, now, so that right now uh, we have had interest expressed um, from Guam, who would like to move forward, uh, Palau. Um, so, like Palau, Guam, Sienna, Commonwealth, Northern Mariana Islands. Um, and uh, I don't believe we've heard from Federated States of Micronesia or American Samoa. Um, now, there's two options there. Uh, uh, RMI or the Republic of the Marshall Islands is working through a vendor that provides their NED based services um, support, and that's fine. Um, when we're looking at Palau, Palau is a freely associated state, which means it is a separate nation. It is a part of the US affiliated uh, Pacific Islands, um, but is a separate nation. What that means is that their, um, their uh, what do you call the, the digits in the front of their phone number, like 212 or whatever it happens to be, um, is from a, is another country. And that would add a considerable cost to add Twilio to a foreign uh, account for phone calls and tweet, tweeting. So we're working with them. That may mean they're gonna start out with emails um, and we have talked about and looked at potentially off, um, adding uh, social media like WhatsApp, which is an encrypted program. Um, but we are working with them on that to figure out um, how do we work with international phone calls and tweets. And we have been also contacted by Costa Rica and other countries that have an interest. And so that's something we'll that's something to solve. But yes, we also in the Atlantic we are obviously actively working with Puerto Rico and we've had conversations with the US Virgin Islands. Great, Dan. A lot of really good work happening there. Allison Dye asks, is there an opportunity to have preloaded return to work letter that can automatically upload a case's contact information and be electronically signed if they need one? That is a very interesting question. And Kelly Hay is somewhere on this line, who is our, our, an epidemiologist, former state epidemiologist from Alexandria County, Virginia. And she is what's called the product owner. So she has a huge responsibility of being the public health interface with the software engineering team 
And Kelly, I don't know if you can either come on or chat an answer to that, or we can get back to you. Sure. Um, can you hear me? Yes, great. Thanks, mm -hmm. Kelly. Great. Uh, thanks for the question. So we have heard uh, a similar request from some jurisdictions about can Sarah Alert send an automated message to cases after uh, isolation has been discontinued to help with that reducing the burden of reaching out to those individuals if they do need a work release letter or some other um, written notice from the health department, uh, again, to help automate that workflow. So we brought it up during one of our feature review calls a few weeks ago, and that's where we talk with our production users about uh, requirements and priorities to help make sure that Sarah Alert is meeting users' needs. And what we found out was, you know, some jurisdictions are supportive of automating that uh, piece of the tool. Um, some other jurisdictions wanted to think about the legal implications of the system sending out that notice rather than that message coming directly from the health department. Um, so I think that's a great question and it's something that um, we'll continue to think about. And as Sarah Alert matures over time, we're always looking at ways to increase the configurability at the jurisdiction level in the system. So I know Paul has talked about how Sarah Alert is configurable for different diseases and there's other things that we can configure in the system. And perhaps this is something that we can offer in the future, where if a jurisdiction wants this sort of uh, automated message to go out from Sarah Alert, um, that we could su support that for some jurisdictions and not others um, to accommodate those different workflows. So I think that's a great question. Uh, we have uh, more to learn about what those requirements are. Um, and I, I think potentially the solution in the future will be to offer flexibility for jurisdictions to opt in or opt out of that feature. Thank you, Kelly. Danny? Yeah, we have another follow-up question from Allison. And she says, thank you for commenting on individuals who don't have technology or are not tech savvy. And I think this was something that you guys were talking about earlier in the session. Um, and, and also adding people that are not English. Uh, is there an option for people uh, who are vision impaired? And for that question, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Denise, who is our strategic communication lead on the Sarah Alert project. Denise? Um, that's a terrific question. Um, one of the options for Sarah Alert is um, the phone call, which um, the phone system for uh, the visually impaired. Um, we also have other options. I'm I'm going to turn it over to Nicole to answer that question. Hi, yeah, just to reiterate what Denise said, um, for those who are visually impaired, the phone call option is probably going to be the best choice. Um, the other options uh, that we've described are uh, the email, emailed web link, texted web link, and a plain SMS text. Um, that plain SMS text we found is also useful for um, the individuals that are a little bit less technologically savvy, like you mentioned. Um, so I hope that answers your question. If you had any follow-up, please feel free to send it in the chat. Right, and, and the system is 508 compliant, correct? Yes, uh, Paul, sorry, I, I was unmuting myself. Yes, it is 508 compliant and um, we're working to make all of our materials and interactions with um, um, individuals being monitored to be 508 compliant, um, including all of our website materials as well as um, the direct interaction through the Sarah Alert system. So we have one last question left from the audience, but if there's something been nagging in the back of your head and you really want to get that out, now is the time. And so we're going to ask this question. If anyone else has anything else, I'll make sure that comes up to the panelists. And uh, then we'll ask one last final parting question. So this one comes from Teresa Olson. Uh, are you in any kind of negotiation with California? And what is the best way for me to get my public health department to view your demo? So, uh, great question. Um, we have uh, provided demos to California. It was early on, um, and I, you know, I don't even know what day a week it is, but it was in the spring sometime. Um, and California did go with another solution, as many of the larger states with resources did. did. Um, but having said that, one of the things we're finding um, is that some of the systems realize that they can be enhanced 
and have come back to, to talk to us more, uh, some of these big states. And we are having counties within some of the larger states come back to us now to try to work specifically with us even separate from the state. Um, so we are available and happy to speak with um, either the California counties, uh, which are very sophisticated health departments and or the state. Um, what we want is we want everybody to have a tool that works for them. So if California has a tool that works for them, great. If they have another tool that Sarah Alert could enhance with this free open source software, that's great too. Um, we're, we're, you know, again, we're not selling anything and no one's buying anything. So if we can help, we're happy to. Um, what are, the other thing we found was um, a number of jurisdictions want the entire system soup to nuts. Um, and they're, they're looking for that. And there are vendors out there who say, well, we can sell you the whole big system. We're, 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 the way we're looking at it is Sarah Alert sh should be a tool to view it as a tool that specifically automates the work of the epidemiologist and the public health professional at contact tracing, at actively monitoring people in isolation and quarantine. <clears throat> um, and if you have another tool, a NEDS-based system, MAVEN, whatever happens to be, even a tool that does um, your, your customer relationship management, uh, your CRM, we can interface with them through the API. We don't need to be the, the whole tool um, because if you have tools that work, keep using them. Um, so it's a little bit of a different approach than, than some who say that their product does everything from beginning to end. Um, you know, Sarah talked, Robinson talked about how this interacts with their NED-based system. The other thing that we did in Sarah Alert, we felt, you know, again, the, the privacy and security is paramount to us. So someone is in Sarah Alert as long as um, they are being actively monitored. And when their case is closed out, two weeks approximately after the last touch of that case, Sarah Alert. We don't want the security risk of having that information in there any longer than necessary. Not that I mean, it's a highly secure system, but there's a lot of smart people around this world. And so what we do is work with a jurisdiction to download it out of Sarah Alert into your syndromic surveillance system, your NEDS based system, whatever it happens to be, so that you have the information going forth for your research for whatever you'd like to do, but it's not exposed through Sarah Alert. Again, we put the security of Sarah Alert up against any system. But why, why allow a vulnerability? on official to local health official because epis listen to epis health officials listen to health officials right just one one quick follow-up there uh, tl asks uh, sorry if they missed it but uh paul mentioned a weekly demo is there information available on how to participate there certainly is and uh, nicole would you like to answer that one Sure, I'd be happy to. Um, so if you go to our website, it's saraalert.org. There's a contact form there. Um, and one of the options for contact is to inquire about attending one of our demos. You can send a request there and we'll be happy to get over the information for those. Yeah, uh, and then we're also, you know, if you, any connections we can make with other users for you so you really can kick the tires, we're happy to do that. You know, I just wanna also make the point that, again, we're not selling anything. We're looking for partners like you've heard with Sarah um, and Elizabeth, who will actually get in there and help perfect this thing, for, not that there's ever perfection, but improve this thing continually for public health. Because our goal is that this tool is an enduring tool that is available to public health. So day one of whatever the next outbreak is, we change the database requirements, it can monitor whatever disease it is, ideally monitor before people come into the country or as they try to enter the country if it's a, an outbreak that occurs overseas to begin with. We, I think, all know how much we really um, were disadvantaged by having people enter the country, not be monitored, and then finding we had widespread community outbreak. If we had only had a system like this standing up at the border when this was still in China and parts of Europe, we would have been in a much different situation today than we are today. 
So um, let me ask, turn to the panelists, any last words of wisdom you'd like to share with anybody online? We really greatly appreciate your participation and, and sharing your wisdom with us today. If I, if I could amend that just a little bit, Paul. So Elizabeth sure. had a really good comment earlier about one of her really big lessons learned of being a part of Sarah Alert was flexibility and adaptability. I'd like to ask the other panelists, and if Elizabeth, if you want to kind of expand on that a little bit, um, starting with Sarah, uh, what has been your biggest lesson learned from being a part of Sarah Alert? Thank you, David. I think our biggest lesson learned probably has been to try it. You just have to jump in and see how it goes and then be willing to when you identify an issue, figure out a way to work around it and work with the partners to figure out solutions to it. But I think you can't be afraid that it's not going to work. You just have to get in there and try it and find out what it can do for you. It's been a life send for us. It's, it's, we wouldn't be able to do the work we're doing without it, so. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Sarah. Dr. Allen? You're on mute. Oh, I would say that the, um, my best answer for this is get in involved. And I say that because oftentimes, as I mentioned, things are built, local health isn't at the door when it's being built or even inside the, inside the, the, the room. Um, and of course, things are built from that lens of this is, this, this is a problem, let's, let's solve it this way, and then folks will come by recognizing that it was going to take investment of time and energy um, and pulling up the sleeves, which is another reason why, you know, not only NATO, but we brought our, um, you know, one of our, our presidents and our past presidents and other locals who were in the midst and getting them involved and trying and, and rationalizing that if we put in the time now, we will see the benefit of the outcome, um, not only for ourselves, but for you know other locals, so that in itself, I would say, um, it has been the best way I can answer that question. Because even seeing jurisdictions where, like for example, Pennsylvania, their questions are not about well, why do we have the system, but how do we make the system better? So that's even an evolution from the concept of well, will people use it? Yes, they're using it because we got involved. Thank you, Oscar. Yeah, that's really great. And uh, change management circles, when anyone hears, if you build it, they will come, they will start big blaring si sirens go off in your head because you know that's not how things work and that's not how things get adopted. So that's really great lesson for all of us to learn. Elizabeth, would you like to expand at all on your flexibility and your adaptability lesson learned or do you have another one? Um. I think really echoing Sarah's comments again, you know, that flexibility and adaptability, but also being willing to try it. Um, Sarah Alert was actually brought to me by a medical student volunteer that we had on board assisting with contact tracing. Um, we were utilizing KU Medical Center's student volunteers uh, to help with contact tracing and they brought this to me and I'm like, mm -mm, no, uh, things are crazy right now and there's no way that we can try something new right now. We're barely you know, doggy paddling and staying afloat right now. Um, but then it goes back to that adaptability and willingness to try new things. And I'm glad that I listened to that medical student and we, we tried it. Wow, I'd love to know who that student was to send him a note. That's incredible. Yeah, that's great. And, uh, and to cap this off, uh, Paul, do you have any lessons learned or words of wisdom to send us off? You know, I, as I think back, um, across at least my career in public health, the things have been, that have been the most gratifying are the things when people say, you could never do that, right? <laughs> and, and I remember the first day we were down at a digital bridge meeting and I was talking to Jeff, um, uh, Jeff Engel, who was at the time still the, the executive director of CSTE. Oscar was there, a bunch of people, and I'm talking to the public health people about, hey, you know, we all know we need this. How about if we try to build it? And they sort of look at you like, you're crazy. And, and Jeff goes, you know, that would be amazing if you can do it. And I have to say that, that getting back to the just try it thing, we're never going to solve these huge audacious problems if we just don't try it. And, you know, I'll say that we're lucky that the, the states, the locals, the jurisdictions, tribal territorial jurisdictions 
and the incredible people you see on the panel here came together to make this work because that is why it worked. It was taken on as a public health community. Um, and this will succeed. But even if these big, hairy, audacious things don't succeed, there's no shame in trying. So um, we're lucky this one's moving. And for me, I just to say this has been so much fun to learn from the, the public health people, from the EPIs, and from the software engineers. Um, and in response to someone's question, I am a certified and proud Luddite. Um, but to, to see what these people do is just amazing. So yeah, join in. It's exciting. It's fun. And um, and it's exhausting, like anything else in a pandemic. So. That's great. And we just had one really late question come in from uh, Mariel Torres Ramirez. Uh, she asked, uh, to echo uh, Trissa Olson, are you in any kind of negotiation with Wisconsin, aside from the Great Lakes Intertribal Council? Uh, Nicole, let me ask you about Wisconsin. Yeah, we're not currently in discussions with Wisconsin, but again, would just invite you to reach out if it's something you're interested in either at the state or local level. Um, and for others on the call who might have a similar question about their state, uh, we definitely encourage you to go ahead, use that contact form and reach out and we'd be happy to have some conversations with you. Yeah, and usually our, our best contacts are an introduction to the after your state health official or someone who's running the contact tracing area. Um, and let me just say that, that in Wisconsin, it's been wonderful to work with the Great Lakes Tribal Consortium, and they have gotten us in touch with the national network of tribal epicenters, which has just been a tremendous uh, opportunity to, to uh, learn from and, and interact with, engage with the tribal um, epicenters across the country. So again, let me say thank you so much, Oscar. Thank you so much for your, um, from day one, your engagement, your involvement, and your expertise. Um, and, you know, both Sarah and Elizabeth, uh, you were both real early adopters here and have contributed so much to this. And um, I think this will, Sarah Alert will be part of your legacy. So uh, thanks for all you have done um, here. And um, I have to mention what an incredible team of folks we have, some of whom you heard, many of you didn't, that might are working on this. Um, and what an honor it is for us to work uh, with the public health community. Because, uh, we respect what you do. We respect the science that, that, uh, that you base your work upon. Um, and we recognize the weight of putting Sarah Alert there because anything we do, um, we want to reflect well upon public health um, and the respected position you have in um, our, our culture, society, and nation. So thank you for the lives you save and all that you're doing. Um, any, if anyone would like, there is an email here, the web page. We're happy to hear from you. and. Um, Again, I hope you get some rest uh, and thanks for what you're doing every day to keep us safer. Thank you. Enjoy the rest of the conference, folks. Thank you, Oscar. Be sure to uh, go to the virtual exhibit hall while you're waiting for the closing plenary to start at 1 p.m. But thank you everybody for all your time, energy and passion. Thank you. <laughs>